today I really wanted to talk about how you can't just think about these amazing algorithms that we have now in isolation. You can't just sort of put them on a shelf and look at them and, and, and marvel at them. You have to think about how they're actually going to be used by people. Because as soon as you start including people into a story, stuff gets really messy. You know, ultimately, humans are just deeply flawed in a lot of ways. And you really have to take a lot of that into account. You know, we have this weird relationship with machines. We, we have this habit of over-trusting them, you know, following sat-nav off the edge of a cliff sometimes, or seeing them as this easy source of authority and just totally putting our faith in them. And then on the other hand, when algorithms are shown to be even slightly flawed, we have this habit of just throwing them all away together and just thinking they're total, total nonsense. And the reality is actually something, it's almost always something in between. And I think that we have to make sure that when we're designing our systems, we're thinking about flawed humans at every single step of the process. I don't think people are particularly aware at all, really, that of just how much data there is about us out there. I mean, I think we're very aware that, you know, Google knows our name, it knows where we live, you know, it knows when we're going on holiday, all of these different kind of things. But it's the inferred characteristics that I think that people are perhaps less aware of. So, you know, there are these big companies, data brokers, who are, I mean, their sole purpose essentially is to, to collate data on us, infer things about us, and then sell it and, and pass it on for profit. And the things that they have on us are stuff like whether or not our parents were divorced, um, whether you've had an abortion, whether you've had a miscarriage maybe, what your true sexuality is, what your declared sexuality is, and if those are different. Things like, you know, whether we've ever used drugs, whether we have the propensity for a gambling addiction. All of these kind of things are, are being sold around as a means to essentially manipulate us at some point. I think it's slowly changing already. I mean, I think that the Cambridge Analytica scandal was the first time when people really sort of sat up and took genuine notice of just how far this stuff has gone. And I think that when you start having this stuff impacting our democracy, which essentially it has, you know, that's really very, very serious. But I also think that in some ways, the only real way to save us is through regulation. You can't expect all of these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of private companies to just suddenly take on some self-ascribed moral code. And simultaneously, I don't think you can expect the individual in the street to be fully literate immediately in all of this stuff. It's just not realistic. I think that you know GDPR is, a, is definitely a step in the right direction, although we've mostly just been drowning in terms and conditions for the last four, four or however many months. Um, but I think it's really going to be stuff like that. I think that's the only real way to, to save us. But I think it will happen. I, I'm optimistic. There's something in Chicago that's called the Chicago Strategic Subject List. And the idea behind this is that they want to predict who's going to be involved in gun crime, right? Massive problem in Chicago. And the, the theory behind it is pretty sound, actually. You know, you have, um, you analyze the network of individuals, and it's based on this idea that today's, uh, today's victim is tomorrow's perpetrator and vice versa. So you have these communities where lots of gun crime is happening. You can analyze that and make these kind of predictions. And the motivation behind this stuff was pretty sound as well. The idea was that you would come up with a list of names of people who were likely to be involved in gun crime in the future, not distinguishing between perpetrator or victim, and have some kind of intervention program where someone turns up at your house and says, we see the path that you're headed down, and here's this intervention program that we have designed for you and we want to help you. It's all kind of very positive. The only problem is that it didn't at any point take into account just how you can't put something like that in the hands of people who have a different set of incentives. Because as soon as police had access to this list, Essentially, the way that they use it, Rand, Rand study um, that investigated this is the kind of conclusion they came to. The way that they use it is when they had an unsolved homicide, they use it as a list of suspects. They start at the top of the list and work their way down. So in the end, the individuals whose names appeared on this list, who had no say in their names appearing on this list, were arrested more than if their name weren't on the list, but were not charged with any more crime. So arrested essentially without evidence of their involvement. And that I think is something where you have, you know, 
a good idea, a, 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 a good motivation, but just you, you've got to think about how it's actually going to be used. I think, if I'm honest, we have to accept that bias is, is inevitable. Some kind of bias is going to be inevitable. But, you know, I also kind of think that if we're aiming for perfection in AI, is that really realistic? What systems outside of AI are completely free from bias? You know, I spent quite a long time thinking about this and I haven't come up with a single example of something that doesn't have any bias. So for me, I think maybe the answer is to stop aiming for perfection. Um, I mean, strive for it, sure, but stop having that as our marker that we're aiming for and instead start accepting that AI will always make mistakes. It's always going to be flawed and instead start designing it for redress, right? When it inevitably makes mistakes. Start, start designing it so that it's easier to appeal and easier to interrogate and easier to interpret. I think that's the, you know, the, the, the more important thing to me. This isn't a new thing. I mean, you know, back in the 1940s when people were talking about electronic brains, there was a whole, you know, furore of, of, of uh, fear about this machines are going to come and take over. You know, it's a similar, same story that we've seen now. Um, and I think that, yeah, there is, we have this, you know, wonderful position as humans that we feel that we're sort of uniquely capable of doing all of these different things. And it does feel slightly threatening to have that position potentially, um, you know, have something else come and share it with us. I can understand that, that as a species we're, you know, it's our instinctive reaction. But I also sort of think that, you know, the, I think the way that AI is depicted in science fiction, while it's a good way to explore those dystopian themes, I also think that it makes one, one quite big mistake, which is that, you know, how, maybe it didn't do what you uh, wanted it to do, maybe it went off piece, but it worked, right? It worked without mistakes. You know, you have like facial recognition in films, it's like, blah, 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 that's the person. Um, in reality, the ones out in the field actually have a 98% failure rate. Um, and I think that that's um, <laughs> it's like, there's a big problem with, with how much people, how, how perfectly functioning people expect AI to be.